Hello and welcome to West Park Church Online and happy Mother's Day to all the mother and motherhood figures, to all the women that are out there. This is your day. My name is Neil Chota and I'm the pastor of Church Life and thank you for joining us today. We may still not be able to meet due to the lockdown, but we are thankful that we can reach out to each other and have church online. Now here's a greeting from one of our West Park Church families. Welcome to West Park Church. The Bible says Jesus loves us. Well, we want to say a special welcome to those who are visiting with us for the very first time. Thank you for joining us. For more information about West Park, please visit westparkchurch.ca or email us at office at westparkchurch.ca. And if you have a prayer request, please let us know. We as staff and elders would love and be honored to pray for you this week. If you have a request, just email office at westparkchurch.ca and we will be praying for you this week. Also, we want to thank you for your continued financial support to the church. For more information on our giving options, please visit westparkchurch.ca slash giving. Now, West Park Connection is important, and we want to encourage you to stay connected with us. So join us on Facebook or Instagram, or sign up for our e-news on the homepage. And here are a few announcements to highlight. The London Pregnancy and Family Support Center is having their annual baby bottle campaign from now until Father's Day, but this year is gone all virtual. For more information, please visit their website to donate to this campaign and click on the Formula for Hope banner. We are excited to launch a brand new prayer and outreach project called Pray, Serve, London. For three weeks starting May 30th, we want to mobilize everyone at West Park Church from all language groups and age groups to interact within their neighborhoods. As nicer weather is approaching, we encourage you to go on a prayer walk in your neighborhood, either by yourself or with a family member. Then think of ways to serve your neighbors by helping them with their lawn care or making them meal and dropping it off or running errands for those who just can't do that kind of stuff. Let's show the love of Jesus to others by praying and serving our neighbors. We would love to have as many people involved in this outreach as possible. So sign up at westparkchurch.ca slash London and let's see how many neighborhoods we can make a difference in. Now we are offering a new course in conjunction with the Billy Graham Association called Christian Life and Witness. Let's take a look at this clip to find out what it's all about. Hi everybody, we are excited to be offering the Christian Life and Witness course and I want to invite you to join us. You might be wondering what is this course all about and why should I take it? This is a practical course focused on evangelism and here's what you can expect from it. In lesson one, you'll be encouraged to live an effective Christian life. We will talk about how adversity can actually help build character, the importance of knowing what the Bible says, and how God can work in and through your life. In lesson two, you'll be equipped to share your faith in practical ways. If this is something you find difficult to do, but you want to be someone who is bold and shares Christ with others, this lesson will really help you. In lesson three, We'll explore the needs of new Christians and look at the ways we can help people in their faith journey. There is nothing more exciting than seeing your friends and family come to know Christ, but that's just the beginning. As they grow in their faith, they'll need help from people to cheer them on and to disciple them. This lesson will equip you to do that for new believers. Maybe the idea of sharing your faith is intimidating for you and you're not sure what to say or how to share what you believe with others. Or maybe you've been a Christian for a long time and you've lost your passion for sharing the gospel. This course is exactly what you need. So here's what you need to do. Go to the website you see on the screen for your city, click on the Christian Life and Witness course, decide what night works best for you and register under one of the host churches. These will all be done live on Zoom and you can register and receive all the details you'll need to know. The course starts on May 18th and run for three weeks. So you're committing to 90 minutes once a week for three weeks. Is it worth it? Absolutely. Go online now and register. 
See you soon. In a few moments, we will be watching a tribute video from kids to their moms. But before that, we want to announce a new Sunday prayer emphasis for the next two months called Focus on the West Park Church Family. Each Sunday, we will be praying for a certain theme. This Sunday being Mother's Day, we will be praying for all the women of the church. Now let's join together and pray a prayer of blessing and encouragement over them. Father, we are so thankful for all the women at West Park who call West Park Church home. We pray a blessing upon them. Father, whether they be mothers or grandmothers, aunts, sisters, daughters, Father, we just pray right now a blessing upon all of them. And thank you for the sacrifices that they have made, Father, for the kingdom. We thank you, Father, for the relationship with you. And we pray encouragement in that relationship. We pray blessing upon their lives. And we pray encouragement during this time especially. And Father, I'm reminded about the verse in Proverbs 31, 30 that says, Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And we honor these women and pray a great blessing over them. Be with them now in the seasons that are ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love my mom because she cares about me and respects me. Because you're my best friend. I love you. My mom loves me because I'm her little boy. My mom loves me because I love her. Because we're her child. No, it's because we're her, her we're her sweet sweethearts. And we're her child. Nope. Yep. I love my mommy because she says words to me. I love my mom because she says wash and it the wash and tells me. I love my mom because we have so much in common. My mom loves me because I'm full of surprises. I love my mom because she's nice and beautiful and, and fun. My mom loves me because I'm sweet and hyper. I love my mom because she loves me very much. I love my mom because she gives me hugs and kisses. <laughs> She does everything for me. I love my mom because she's sweet. My mom loves me because I gave her hugs and kisses. My mom loves me because I'm a cooking helper. Um, mom, no, you have kisses to me. I love my mommy because she's kind and beautiful. I love my mom because she loves me. I love my mom because she sacrifices things for me and she's nice to me. I love my mom because she cooks for me and she always helps me with my homework. I love my mom because she's awesome and she's always willing to help. We love our mommy because she always cooks for us and plays with us and gives us warm hugs. I love my mom so much. I love my mommy because because she likes because she makes pretty plays pretty games with me. <laughs> I love my mom because she's always there for me. I love mommy because she gives me the best tickles. I love mommy because she gives me the best hugs. I love my mom because she helps me with my work. I love my mom because she's a great cook. I love my mom because she's the best. I love my mom because she has the best laughs. I love my mom because she makes me happy when I'm sad. I love my mom because she does the best laughing. Okay. <laughs> I love my mom because she's cool. <laughs> I love my mom because she's sweet, understanding, and thoughtful. See, she even gave me this sweater. <laughs> <laughs>
praise Him for the wonders of His love. Praise Him. Praise God. Praise God. is your faithfulness and I will rest in your promises 
my confidence is your faithfulness. And I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. And I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. Faithful, you are God is faithful. Faithful, forever you will be. Faithful, you are on your promises.
Heavenly Father, we just praise you for who you are. God, sometimes we just need to stand in awe and just be in your presence. Sometimes we don't have words to express what we're feeling. Sometimes we're hurting or we're happy. God, I just pray that you would help us to find delight in you the way that you delight in us. God, would you just fill our hearts with the fruits of your spirit? God, would we find joy in your presence? Would we find happiness in a space with you? Would we long to be in your presence? God, would our lives be as evident of your glory that you would be honored through our circumstances, through our lives, to the world around us, to our friends and our family. God, I just pray that through it all, you'd be with us and that it would be evident that you're with us and that you would be glorified. In your name we pray, amen. Good morning, West Park. My name's Corey. I'm the worship pastor, and I'm so looking forward to diving into God's word with you today. To our moms and motherhood type figures, thank you so much for all that you do. Happy Mother's Day. We appreciate you so much. So we are in this series on the book of Revelation, and I must confess that it's been quite some time since I have studied Revelation, and it's I've actually never taught through it, uh, mostly because I, I tended to find myself being in the kind of a little bit afraid category, and not because there's anything to be afraid of in Revelation, but because I didn't want to get it wrong. There's so many different opinions, there's so many different thoughts, I just, I didn't, I wanted to assume that I was going to be right when, when I read through it and when I studied through it and when I taught through it. Well, I don't think that any of us are going to get it perfect. The things that we're going to see in this should help us magnify Jesus because of all that he has done. I've actually stolen the title for my message from a commentator by the name of Warren Wearsby. I, I tried to think of something clever to come up with, but he does such a better job. So Revelation 2, 1 to 7, this is the start of the letters to the seven churches in the province of Asia, now modern day Turkey. These, and it, it's actually kind of interesting, the the letters go in the pattern of, of the town. So Ephesus kind of being the most westernly and then kind of eastward after that. But I've, I've titled the message, The Careless Church. Here's the word of the Lord. Let's read this. If you've got your Bible, get it out and read Revelation 2, 1 to 7 with me. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, I know your hard work, and I know your perseverance. 
I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and you have found them to be false. And you have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things that you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come and I will remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Well, that's a pretty small letter, but it's so, so significant and packed with information that we need to dissect in order to understand. When I was a kid, about five or six years old, I started taking piano lessons. And I remember at an early age really loving playing music. Actually, probably what I loved more than anything was performing music. Uh, I, I kind of was a little bit of an attention seeker. But I remember the early days of learning something new, learning a new skill, learning a new scale, and learning a new song, and being so excited by that because I just loved to play. I loved the opportunity. I loved the, the excitement that revolved around that. But as I moved on, like I took piano for a, a good number of years, like 12, 13 years. I remember nearing the end of my time taking lessons, I was just doing the things that I was supposed to do out of obligation. I was practicing because if I didn't, then my teacher would be upset, or I was doing my exams for similar reasons, and if I wasn't practicing at home, I was going to hear about it from my parents. I was just, I was kind of doing the things that I thought were important to do out of almost habit, but not a habit that was good just because I knew that if I did it, then I could get away with feeling like I'd, I'd checked off the box. I'd done what it was that I was supposed to do. And then I remember the end of my time and just feeling like, oh goodness, I really should have loved this more. I really should have appreciated it more. I really should have had that same kind of love that I had at first. The big idea today is this, to regain our first love, as Jesus calls it, we need to reorient our hearts with four practices. Now, there are so many more than four, but this is what I think is most um, important to us today. So we're going to walk through Revelation 2, 1 to 7, verse by verse, and I'm going to give us some ideas of these four things that will help us to reorient our hearts and help us to love Jesus better. Jesus says this, to the angel of the church at Ephesus, so here's the place that we're writing to, these are the words of him, Jesus, who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now, we know from last week that these seven golden lampstands actually represent the churches that these different seven letters were written to. But what about this? What about Ephesus? What do we actually know? Well, it was a first century city. It was the capital of Asia, uh, Asia kind of east, or, or Rome east was kind of the capital of that area. It was also highly motivated by pagan worship, particularly of the goddess, the Roman goddess Artemis, or Diana. And uh, there's, there, it was actually one of the seven ancient wonders of the world, the, the giant temple Parthenon to Diana. It was a place where Worship of false gods included orgies and sexual deviance. It included incredible amounts of drunkenness. But because Ephesus was also the, the capital of what it was to be Roman in the kind of eastern part of the known world, there was also significant emperor worship of claiming that emperor himself, the, the Caesar, was actually a god on earth, and as he claimed to be that, you should bow down and worship him and offer him your allegiance as well. We also know that Ephesus was planted in part by the Apostle Paul in about 52, 53 AD, and then was pastored by Paul during his second missionary journey in uh, in about 63, 62, 63, 64 AD uh, for about two years, and then later on was pastored by uh, Paul's protege, Timothy, and was also pastored by this same apostle writing Revelation, the apostle John. 
Paul also wrote an earlier letter to the church at Ephesus, the Ephesian letter. And if you've, if you've gone through your Bible, you've seen the, the letter to the Ephesians. I, Paul, an apostle of the Lord Jesus, and he kind of goes through it. The interesting thing about those letters, in particular Ephesians, is it's, it's so doctrinally sound, it's so doctrinally significant to the church today, that it's, as John Piper says, it's, it's kind of the, the summit before the peak of New Testament doctrine and belief. Um, Romans kind of being the peak, but the summit, like, so close to the top is Ephesus because it's, it's of its significance. The letter of Ephesians, and actually most of the New Testament letters, the epistles, are, are kind of broken up into two sections. Paul in particular does this. He writes one half, the first half, being these are the things that you ought to know about how the gospel should reorient your heart to God. What it means to be saved, what it means to be selected and chosen, what it means to be part of the faithful. And then the second half of those letters end up being now, this is what you ought to do. This is how you should live in light of these gospel-defining realities that reorient your heart to God. And so that's what we have in these letters. So it's, it's interesting that, that this church at Ephesus, which was birthed in about Acts 19 kind of um, time frame, and then was pastored by Paul, and he spent time there about 10 years after that. And now, 40 years on in its history, in about 96 AD, Jesus says these things to this church that we know a little bit about. He tells them really, really significant stuff. And these seven golden lampstands at the end of this verse, again, these are those churches of the seven churches, Ephesus being one of them. And so because Ephesus was such an important city to Rome, the Christians are going there and they're living kind of in this, in this, this position of, well, how do we follow Jesus and still be Roman? And, and the entire book of Ephesus is, no, you're, you're supposed to change. You're supposed to be like Jesus. You're supposed to be gospel focused and understand that your worship of him is the most significant and, and deny the worship of false gods and deny the worship of Roman leaders. And so then we have this in verse 2. This is what Jesus actually says to the church at Ephesus. He says, I, Jesus, I know your works. I know your labor. And this word labor is significant. It's actually the word toiling to exhaustion. It's the idea of working so hard that you just find yourself exhausted. And your endurance, meaning you continue to do this. You work hard, you work hard, you work hard. And then when you're tired, you keep on working hard. And also says that you cannot tolerate evil people. Well, that, that's exactly what Paul was trying to help the Ephesians do. They were trying to be separate from the things that were going on in Ephesus. Jesus says, you have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not so they've, they've tested people who have come in. There were these false teachers that would come in. Much, much of the New Testament letters, many of them actually talk about this. Be on guard for false teachers because they're going to come in. They're going to infiltrate. They're going to try and distract you from true doctrine. And he says, and you have found them to be what they are. You have found them to be liars. These are all good things. And then he says this. Jesus continues, I, Jesus, know that you have persevered which is a huge statement that much of the New Testament talks about because you're going to be persecuted as a Christian. And in the first century, persecution was a huge issue. And as, they, as it continued and continued, the call from these pastors, the call from the apostles as they wrote the New Testament was persevere in faith. Jesus will faithfully hold on to you as you faithfully persevere for him. Then he says, you've endured hardships for the sake of my name. Because you bear the mark Christian and you're, and you're enduring these difficulties and he, pray, he, he thanks them, and he, he directs them, and he says, and I know that you've done this, and you have not grown weary. Jesus acknowledges their perseverance. He acknowledges their work. He acknowledges their separateness from the world. He acknowledges all of these things about 40 years on in their history. And so everything seems like a gleaming success at Ephesus, right? They're keeping themselves pure. They're trying to remain doctrinally sound. They're trying to do the things that Jesus has called them to do. And yet we have this, but I, Jesus, and I'll even make it a little bit more significant for our understanding, your king have this against you. What is it that he has against? They have abandoned the love that you had at first. Ouch. 
Because you just kind of imagine yourself being this Ephesian church. But, but, but God, we've, we've done the things that you've wanted us to do. So this, this means that we love you. This means that we're doing the right stuff. But it's important to understand that just because we're doing good things doesn't mean that we're doing it the right way. One commentator says it like this. Just think of it like this. Is it, it is possible to serve, sacrifice, and suffer for my name's sake. That's what Jesus says in this passage. And yet not really love Jesus Christ. The Ephesian believers were so busy, what? Maintaining their separation from the world, from Ephesus, from the Roman situation, that they were neglecting adoration. Labor is no substitute for love, neither is purity a substitute for passion. I love that statement. The church must have both if it is to please him. See, doing the right religious things is good, of course it is, but to be a reflection of Jesus to the world, we need to be different and set apart and focused, laboring for the Lord and pure, but oh, this so much more is the reason for why we do it out of a love for our Savior, Jesus. And then he says that we need to do actions that are fitting of, his, of, of our first love. He says, you've, you've abandoned your first love. This is what I hold against you. In verse 4, you have forsaken or abandoned the love that you had at first. My, my life group is going through Tim Keller's marriage book right now. It's fantastic. And in the meaning of marriage, he lays out what it looks like to be a person in your marriage who continually is being filled with the Holy Spirit. And he says that it's process, but I think that this applies exactly the same way to our Christian lives individually. He says it like this. This does not happen overnight, of course. It takes years of reflection. It requires disciplined prayer, Bible study, and reading, innumerable conversations with friends, and dynamic corporate worship. What are we told that it takes to reclaiming our first love? Well, in no small part, it's reflection, it's prayer, it's Bible study, and it's worship. Now, that's, that's a Keller quote, but I think we can impose it into this text because Jesus says you've lost your passion. You're doing things out of obligation, and while those things are good, you're missing the whole point. Another commentary says it like this, it is only as we love Christ fervently that we can serve him faithfully and our love for him must be pure. All right, we're going to come back to these ideas a little bit later. Then in Revelation 2, 5 and 6, it continues. Remember then how far you have fallen. This is Jesus speaking, remember. How far you've fallen. He's talking to Christians. So he says to the Christians, you've fallen, so Repent. Change your thinking, change your ways, and do the works you did at first. If you actually go to Acts chapter 19 to 20, you'll see the birthing of the church at Ephesus and the things that they did, laying down their occult practices, selling and or, or bur burning their, their witchcraft documents and getting rid of things that were of high value and repenting and trusting in Jesus. And then Jesus continues. He says, otherwise I, Jesus, your king, he will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. There's that word again, unless you repent. Yet you do have this. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, okay, guys, you've, you've missed the opportunity. You've missed the mark here. You need to go back to doing the first thing. Love me. Follow me. Adore me, adore the gospel, be, be united to Christ. Don't just do things out of obligation, but do them because of your great love for Jesus and allow that to stir and motivate your affections to love him more. So if, if that's where you are and you're, uh, you're, you're feeling your sense of obligation is, is everything that's a part of your Christian life, the difference now is to repent. Do the things you did at first. Repent, believe, trust, seek Jesus, be excited about him, get a grander vision. And so this is what Jesus does. He gives them grace. Jesus extends grace 
to the people at Ephesus. He says, here's the way to make it back. Here's the way to change, to repent and believe. He's not actually asking them to do something different. He's asking them to do what they had already done. And this warning is all grace. This is Jesus telling them, if you do this, it's going to go well for you. Because the result of continuing in this busy, obligated, program-driven business for the sake of doing it not for love of Jesus, but just because you feel like if you don't, you're going to get punished. Well, what does Jesus say? He says, or I will remove your lampstand from its place. Now, because we know that the lampstands in Revelation are the seven churches, these, these lampstands are represented by the seven churches that these letters are being written to, we know that Jesus is not talking about removing their salvation. He's not. Jesus doesn't remove salvation from those that he chooses. What he gives, he will never take away when it comes to salvation. But he does say this. He says, I'll remove your church. I will remove your influence. Basically, this is what Jesus is saying. If you don't get back to the purity of the gospel of centered life on me, I will remove your church and its influence. I will not allow for your church to be loveless to its husband like an unfaithful wife would be to her husband. So much more could be said about this. But don't fall into that trap. I know that my heart is so, so quickly able to jump to that, to missing the opportunity that Jesus could, if I'm not careful, he could remove my influence. He could say, if you're not going to do this right, then you're not going to do it at all. Still love you, but you're missing out. You're missing the mark. But then in, in this part, in verse 6, Jesus gives this encouragement. He says, yet you do have this. So it's, it's not all a wash. You've done good things before. You're doing the religious things. And while they're good, you're missing the most important thing. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, I did a lot of study on these Nicolaitans people. I didn't find very much. It seems to be that these were people trying to infiltrate churches and trying to advance some kind of hybrid religious system. Christianity plus being a Roman emperor worshiper. And obviously that's a problem because Jesus wants our full devotion, not our 50% devotion. So the Ephesians, for the issue for the Ephesians were not that their actions were wrong, they didn't need to change their actions. Jesus says, I know your work. I know your hard toiling labor. I know your perseverance. I know you're, 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 you're staying firm as you try and do what's right for the sake of my name. But he's saying, you've missed what you need to love, which is me. Here's what we don't need. Churches in the West, we don't need more programs. We don't need more activities to help our people love Jesus. What we actually need is to get a better view of Jesus. We need a better belief about Jesus. We actually need to be floored with who Jesus is. This is what Colossians 1 says. And Colossians is my very, very, very favorite book. This is Colossians 1 verse 15 to 20. If you're struggling, you need to have a better view of Jesus. Let this be it. That the Son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything Jesus might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. That's the view of Jesus that we need to get. 
that he is the most magnificent. He is the best. He is the greatest treasure. That's the Jesus that we need to fall in love with again. Not the Jesus of our cultural making that that makes us think if we just do the right religious obligations that we're somehow going to appease God. No. We need to be awestruck again at the glory of Jesus. How do we do that? You get to the gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The good news of Jesus Christ, which offers power to resurrect dead souls. We need to love this. We need to love the Jesus of the good news. The gospel being that Jesus comes to live for us the perfect life that we could never live and dies on our behalf to both satisfy the wrath of God and to pay our penalty for sin. He stayed in the ground for three days, paying that penalty, and on the third day was risen to new life, proving his power over death itself because he was innocent. And it, and it affords him the opportunity to give you his perfection if you would trust in him for salvation by grace and faith alone. That's the gospel. It should help us understand that there is a grander view of Jesus to be seen. It's, it's Colossians 1 language about Jesus. We have to get a right view of the gospel so that we can get back to doing the things that Jesus wants us to do, to love him. And out of our overflowing love, we serve So how do, how do we apply this? And we're going to kind of fly through this quickly. It said that there are four practices. Here's the first one. We lose our love for Christ when the gospel becomes an offer we accepted and not our source of life. This is, this is beyond just understanding that the gospel is a message of salvation that I accepted a long time ago, and because I accepted it, I now have my free ticket to heaven. No, we're, we're supposed to understand that the gospel saved us, is saving us, and ultimately will save us. We need to transform our thinking. The gospel itself is your source of life. Without the gospel being true for you, there is no hope. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. If the resurrection didn't happen, there is no hope. We should be pitied among all people. But because the resurrection is true, our whole life flows from the good news of the gospel. This is what Paul says again in Colossians. He says, If indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope, the gospel that you heard, this gospel has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven. There's so much to be said about this, but I don't have the time. The gospel has been preached to all of creation and God is redeeming it through Jesus' work to himself. Here's a great way of looking at this. Tim Keller, who you're probably going to get sick of me using and quoting. He's, he's kind of my, my favorite author. I, I appreciate him so much. This quote is something that has stuck with me for years and years. We never move on from the gospel to something more. We never can, and we never need to. It should be so encouraging to us. We don't have to move on to something else because there's nothing better to move on to. That should strike us as this is our source of life. And when we remove the gospel from the equation, yes, we lose our love for Jesus because we're not really thinking that we did anything that bad. No, we, we never have to move on from the gospel. We never need to. Galatians 1 says it like this, Paul speaking, I am amazed that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Then he says this, which is so significant, not that there is another gospel, because there isn't. That's false teaching if there's somebody who says the gospel is different than the Bible. But there are some who are troubling you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Here's the problem. We buy it. 
And in so doing, we lose our love for Jesus. When we don't see the gospel as our source of life, what we end up doing is miss out on the life-giving reality that, of what Jesus has done for us, what we could never have done for ourselves so that we can have the life that we could never live. That's the gospel. Second, we lose our passion for Christ when worship becomes a religious activity and not a weapon. This flows directly from the realities of seeing the gospel as our source of life. When we truly walk in the truth of the gospel every day, we actually worship God first. We put him first. We put Jesus first because only he is worthy of praise. Only he is worthy of worship. When the church gathers, we're not singing songs to encourage our own hearts. We're singing songs to embolden the battlefield because there is a fight happening. Worship is a weapon. When we worship Jesus, we're putting him where he, desi where he desires for us to see him. Exactly where he is, on the throne as king. And what worship does is it gives us the opportunity to fight against the evil one in our world who hates us and hates the kingdom, the devil and his demons, and we worship Christ in his face. It's a weapon. It emboldens believers. I say this all the time. When you worship corporately, you're not just singing songs. You're encouraging the people around you by singing truth so that they can be emboldened as well. Sunday morning should never be just a religious activity. It should always be training for the battle. It should always be seen as a weapon. It's not just a weapon, though. It's also our opportunity to adore Jesus. This comes from Psalm 63. This is David speaking. My lips will glorify you because your faithful love is better than life. So do this, church. Praise him with the tambourine and dancing. Praise him with strings and flutes. And there's a third one. We lose our desire for Christ when prayer becomes an obligation and not an experience of God's presence. Did you know that when you pray, God does things that he wouldn't otherwise necessarily do if you hadn't? Did you know that when you ask God to intervene, you are submitting yourself to his rule and his reign? This is not some obligatory practice that we should just do it because it feels right. Like if we don't pray, Jesus is somehow going to be displeased with us. We should understand that it's prayer is to experience God in his presence. Now, that doesn't mean that we just pray and we ask God, here's all the things that I want. Please give me all my desires. No, prayer is submitting everything before God, asking him to do in us what we can't do for ourselves by the work of his spirit, and then listening to him. Listening to him faithfully, fervently, passionately, seeking his voice before we make decisions, looking to be in God's presence. Now this happens both corporately and individually, but it is important that prayer doesn't become an obligation. It is a great joy. And this, this is the one that I struggle with the most. Prayer is the one that I struggle with the most. Out of anything else, any other spiritual discipline, this is the one that is hardest for me. I'm sure it is for you. Or for many of us, it's, it doesn't come naturally. It takes effort. It takes work. But when we can reorient our thinking or reorient our hearts around the fact that prayer is actually an opportunity to be in God's presence, it should change us. And it will change us to love Jesus more. And here's the last one. We lose our awe for Christ when the Bible becomes a textbook and not the word of God. I asked myself this question as I was preparing. When was the last time I sat reading the Bible and I was completely floored at the work of Christ in the pages of Scripture? See, here, here's what can happen. The Bible can become routine because we read it a lot. And we're supposed to read it a lot. It's a good thing to read Scripture a lot. But if we're just reading it so that we can check the box off and saying, uh, yep, I, I did my Bible reading today. Uh, yep, I got through my, my year-long um, 
reading through the Bible plan. Uh, yep, I, I made sure that I, whatever that looks like, we actually miss out on the fact that God is speaking, still living and active this word. He's still speaking through his word today. And I should marvel at that, that the God of the universe has spoken truth to his people and we get to read it. It should floor us every single time. Second Timothy 3, this is a very, very well-known passage. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Another passage, Psalm 119, your, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Hebrews 4, for the word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing the soul from the spirit, joints from marrow, and it judges the thoughts and attitudes of our hearts. It helps us to see what it is that we need and who we are and why we need the gospel. Jesus said it this way, it's written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. If we only ever see the Bible as a textbook, we miss out on the opportunity to see how God wants to speak to us now, today, right now, in this moment. And all we have to do is open a book. And so the response to this is another Colossians passage, which I'm sure you're not surprised by. I already said it's my favorite book in the Bible. This is what Paul encourages Christians. Now that you know what you're supposed to believe, this is what you ought to do. Let the message of Christ or the word of Christ. What is it? Scripture. Dwell in you richly. It's the gospel. Let it dwell in among you richly as you teach one another with wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. That's what it means to be a community, to lovingly serve and follow Jesus, to allow the gospel to dwell in us so richly that we actually teach one another what it means to follow Jesus by encouraging each other, by sharpening iron together. That's what we're called to do. See, as Warsby says, it is only as we love Christ fervently that we can serve him faithfully. Our love for him must be pure. And so here's the opportunity. This is the end of Revelation uh, 2, 1 to 7. Verse 7, it says, So let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Listen to Jesus' message. What was his message? Repent. Repent of your lovelessness. Repent of your carelessness. And go back to what you did at the beginning. And then he says, To the one who conquers, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, before anybody gets any weird thinking here, um, this, this phrase here, to the one who conquers, we're not talking about special Christians. We're not talking about the ones, like the, the real Christians. We're talking about the ones who understand that this is a problem. They repent. They come back to Jesus and they conquer this sin by following hard after him and by, by doing the things that we're supposed to do at first. Loving Jesus. Then Jesus will give them the right to eat from the tree of life and we will live forever. See, what, what saves you is not the amount of your faith, but the object of your faith, the Lord Jesus himself. You're not, I'm, I'm not trying to, to say to anybody this morning that you need to, you need to somehow muster up enough uh, energy or enough passion inside of yourself. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just inviting you to reorient your heart around the, these four practices, understanding the gospel, worship being a weapon, prayer being God's presence among you, and the word of God living and active speaking to us. I'm just inviting you to love Jesus through these common graces that he has given us. See the goodness of God in this wonderful warning. We could be just like them. And I think, honestly, 
that the church in the West is just like this church. We love to be busy. We love to do program. We love to look like we're doing all the right things, but sometimes we don't do it for the right reason. Maybe most times, if we're not careful, we don't do it for the right reason. So allow this to challenge your heart. Take this warning as a warning of grace that Jesus is offering, and then repent and practice these things in a new way so that you can reorient your heart to love for Jesus. I want to pray for you that Jesus would make these changes in us. Father, we are not able to do what it is that I believe you want your church to know in this. And God, I would ask by the power of your spirit, spirit of the living God, would you do in us the work of repentance? Would you lead those of us who feel like maybe we've, we've, we feel like we've got it all together? We're doing all the right things all the time. But if we're not loving you first, Jesus, we have missed the mark. Would you help us to see this, this grace-filled warning as an opportunity to go back to the beginning, to love you first, to be enthralled with the newness of who you are, be enthralled with your glory, wonder at your majesty, be awestruck with who you are. And then to use these, these practices of preaching the gospel to ourselves, of, of worshiping with the community as an opportunity to ready ourselves for battle, to pray expectant to be in your presence, and to read your word as it is, your word to us that you have spoken so that we could know you. Would you do this in us, Jesus? Grant us repentance out of your grace. And send us messengers ourselves. Send us people who are, will encourage us and they will push us and they will help us follow after you. Father, would we be marked, would West Park be marked as a church, not, that, not only that does good things and has great programs, but primarily, almost only, marked by the fact that we desperately love you. Do this, Jesus, in us, I pray for your glory and for our good. Amen. Thanks again for joining us, and we encourage you to be part of the online chats and engage in the after-service questions. And don't forget to go to our homepage and download the discussion study guide to dig deeper into the Revelation series. Also, for all the ladies out there, have a great and blessed Mother's Day. We'll see you next time. Know that you're loved, church. Go in peace.